thanks uh, to the organisers for inviting me, and thanks to, to Susan for um, mentioning a number of the things I want to talk about today, sort of the way of introduction. So what I'm going to talk about today is really who and when to transplant in, in adult ALL. I'm going to leave paediatric ALL out and uh, just draw your attention to this lovely picture, which is actually a bridge in Melbourne, bridging the gap and being from Melbourne. And just to remind people that the um, uh, HSANZ annual scientific meetings in Melbourne this year, it's a beautiful place to visit if you're looking for something to do in late October. So feel free to come along. So um, let's just get started. So there's a few fundamental problems, and I think when we have a new patient, a new adult patient diagnosed with uh, acute lymphoblastic leukaemia, we have a problem. Um, there's a number of problems that we have to address. ALL is not one disease. There are different subtypes, as Susan's already outlined. There's different biologies, different tempos, different responses to therapy, different ages, different cytogenetic groupings, etc. And then why differences exist between elderly patients, adults, and as we're increasingly understanding, uh, uh, younger adults or adolescents who may have a more uh, child-like ALL. And the biggest problem we face, of course, is that the majority of patients achieve a CR, which is great, but the majority of those patients relapse, which is terrible. And the other thing that we face as physicians is that the most effective regimens are also the most toxic. And that doesn't matter whether we're talking about therapies in, during induction or consolidation or ultimately transplantation. There is some good news, and this is a slide a couple of years old now, but this just really shows the survival curves of four different age cohorts. Uh, those who are adolescent uh, between 15 and, and 19 in the top left hand, 20 to 35, to 30, 30 to 44 and over 45. And this has been a substantial improvement over 20 years of the outcome of patients with uh, adult ALL. But the largest improvements have been seen in the youngest patients, and really those patients who are uh, geriatric, over 45, sorry, Marty, I'm joining you there shortly, um, really have a tiny improvement over the 20 years of effort. So really things are still in need of substantial improvement. And one of the key messages I really want to take home, take you, take, get you to take home from today is what happens to those patients that relapse. And some of the best data that we've got is really from Dale Fielding's work and the, and the MRC study at the UCAL 12 study, which showed what happened to patients if they relapsed. No matter what their initial uh, or ultimate treatment course was, whether they were transplanted or not transplanted, but what happens if they relapse? And you can see a dismal curve here. You can prolong the time that it takes to death, and median time is about six months, but ultimately most people relapse, with only about 7% of people actually having a sustained response to whatever salvage they were exposed to. And this, this um, contrasts to some other published series which are shown on this slide about the outcome of patients who are transplanted in CR2. And so this has previously been a, a pattern of practice where perhaps if you're unsure whether you should transplant a patient with adult ALL, you might see whether they relapse because you always had a second chance to reinduce them and salvage them with an allogeneic transplant. But of course, these two curves, B and C, really already have selected patients who have achieved a second re remission, who remain fit enough to proceed to transplant. And yes, in those patients who go on to transplant in second CR, around about 20% may be salvageable. But if you take the starting cohort, it's less than 10% who will actually manage to benefit from uh, intervention if they relapse from initial therapy. So one of the things I think we need to think about when we're, when we're trying to decide about transplantation or any therapy for that matter is what should be our expectations be? When a new patient comes to us, what, would sh what should we say to them about what they should expect from the treatment that we are going to, to give them? So, uh, and here's a photograph of uh, some more bridges in Melbourne. And really, again, the best, uh, largest and most recent data comes from uh, the MRC, uh, UK ALL 14, uh, 12 study, which shows that our expectation nowadays, although admittedly this data has been collected over many years this, in a prospective study, that nowadays our expectation for a new patient coming with, with ALL should be around about 50% long-term survival. Better if they have standard risk disease versus high-risk disease, 
slightly better if they have an allogeneic transplant versus no allogeneic transplant, but the expectation is around about 50%. So when we're uh, assessing how well patients are doing from transplantation, we should be attempting to get above 50%, which is where I think the watermark currently stands. And this is just to reconfirm from another study, and I'm, I apologise if I don't make reference to your favourite study, but really just showing that from the French LALA94 study, that those patients who were transplanted, or who at least who had an HLA donor, had a gain around about a 50% expectation of disease-free survival with long-term follow-up. And that was in high-risk patients. If we go back to the uh, UK ALL uh, study, the, the, the critical thing here was that allogeneic transplantation was a very effective therapy for the treatment of the disease. It may not have necessarily been a very effective treatment for the for the uh, treatment of the patient, but for preventing relapse, it was the most effective approach. So if you can see here, uh, both in standard risk and in high risk disease, graphs A and graphs B, that the relapse rate was substantially reduced, approximately halved, in those patients who had donors compared to those patients who didn't have donors. So allogeneic transplantation is the best way of controlling uh, adult acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And the outcomes with respect to disease-free survival and overall survival were impaired by the higher than acceptable transplant-related mortality. And I don't mean to say that there's another way of reducing that, but I think that's one of the challenges in adult ALL, is to improve the outcome by making transplantation less toxic. So the primary question, I think, really is, isn't um, should we transplant in first remission or should we transplant beyond first remission? I think it should be who should we identify as being people we want to transplant now in first response versus no planned transplant? Because I think if we wait for them to relapse, then the, the, the ship has sailed. We, we don't have a second opportunity to salvage them in the majority of cases. And if we just look at uh, this uh, Cochrane report which came out recently, really just to reiterate what I'm saying is that if you want to control disease, the best thing to do is allogeneic transplantation, but that the overall benefit of favouring a donor with respect to outcome with all of these uh, studies which are listed here for you to see pretty much sit on that midline. They slightly favour overall survival with respect to a donor versus no donor approach. And then if you look at, uh, divide those patients up between high risk disease and standard risk disease, you can see on the lower panel, the standard risk disease, that the, there is a stronger benefit towards uh, having, a, having a transplant, and whereas that benefit starts to become eroded in the higher risk disease shown above, where there really is a, a equipoise with respect to the risks versus benefits. Disease-free survival, again, this is a marker of how well the disease is controlled. Again, overall benefits transplantation from no transplantation in a, series, in a whole series of, uh, of reports. And then really this is the most telling slide, that if you want to control the disease and prevent relapse, shown here on the left, that you clearly benefits having an allogeneic transplant. If you don't want to deliver a therapy to your patient that kills them, i.e. gives them a non-relapse mortality, it clearly favours not transplanting. And it's almost as if these two graphs are uh, magnetically opposed and driven to either side of the slide. So on one hand, we have a therapy that is clearly beneficial with respect to preventing disease from recurring, but a therapy that has substantial toxicity, as I've already said. And this again is shown graphically, this is again from the UK ALL12 ECOG combined data, which shows that as you follow patients through three months, six months, one year, two years, the patients both in the high risk and the standard risk group, that the transplant, non, the transplant sorry, the non-relapse mortalities really starts to take off from six months on, which is when most people are being exposed to transplant, so that by the time you get out to two years, those patients in the high risk group have a non-relapse mortality of 35% three times the patients who are in the no donor group. And the standard risk, almost 20% by two years, again, over three times that in the no donor group. So transplantation still remains a major challenge with respect to avoiding non-relapse uh, non mortality. So really it comes down to, and Susan's already touched some, on some of this already, is that who has the highest risk disease? 
who should, or perhaps more importantly and perhaps more cleanly, who shouldn't get a transplant in CR1, and this comes down to risk stratification. And you've already heard it that uh, there, there are a number of uh, very strong prognostic factors that can be identified either clinically uh, by cytogenetics or immunophenotyping and more recently by molecular analysis of patients who fall into standard risk versus high risk. There are the ones that are well known to you with respect to the circulating white cell count at presentation, age of course, high risk cytogenetic ones which are listed there and as uh, Susan's already outlined, the question mark I think behind CD20 can now be withdrawn I think pretty confidently in adult patients and certainly uh, the introduction of anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody therapy seems to improve the outcome in those patients. So most groups will uh, risk stratify based on these variables, age, white cell count, cytogenetics, and whether or not patients have a, t a, a delay in getting into their initial remission, uh, usually beyond the first four weeks of remission induction therapy. And you can see here just in summation that those patients who enjoy a lower number of those risk factors have a better outcome versus those that have a high accumulation of those risk factors. But as Susan has already indicated from her presentation, that it's unclear whether MRD might actually replace most of these risk factors or even add to them in certain algorithms. In the interest of time, I'll just skip over these, but really what they indicate is that a number of groups have applied those clinical or cytogenetic risk factors, uh, given them summations and identified that patients who have high risk disease do less well. And the last two, the GMAL and the uh, Northern Italian Leukemia Group, uh, studies down, shown down the bottom have incorporated MRD, where patients who have persistent MRD positivity have uh, relapse rates that are exceptionally high and disease-free survival rates that are recorded in single figures versus those who have sustained MRD negativity. So MRD, I think, is really the uh, way of the future, and as indicated in your questionnaire responses, uh, the majority of you would like to or do record MRD responses in your patients with ALL. And really, of course, MRD, if you think about it, and you don't have to think very hard, is really a primary determinant of sensitivity to chemotherapy. It seems to correlate with the ability to achieve a complete remission to the first induction, more rapid clearance of circulating marrow blasts, prednisolone sensitivity, which is well described as a prognostic marker in itself, and has been accepted really for the best part of last uh, 13 or to 15 years by the pediatric uh, uh, leukemia treaters as a critical determinant of disease outcome. And this is just one uh, publication from Lancet uh, around about 14 years old now, which really just shows that those patients who were MRD negative who had low risk disease only had a 2% relapse risk, whereas those patients who had persistent MRD positivity had an 84% relapse rate. And considerable amounts of work have been uh, undertaken by international cooperative groups with respect to the standardization of MRD. I don't have time to go into that uh, today, but there's a reference there from uh, leukemia a couple of years ago that's well worth reading. There's pros and cons of different types of MRD, and depending on your, whether you're a flow cytometrist or a molecular person, you may want to favor one versus the other. I'm not going to talk about PCR analysis of pH positive ALL, but you can see that the advantage, there are advantages of both uh, flow cytometry based uh, approaches and uh, molecular approaches. Again, the majority of patients with um, um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia will be able to be assessed for MRD with either or potentially both of these techniques, and as I say, I don't have time to go into the technical details of those today. So here's an example of a study that's currently open and accruing, recently, uh, recently opened in the UK, the UK ALL14 study. And so what have these uh, consensus experts put into their risk stratification with respect to this study? And you can see that they've incorporated the good old classic clinical presentations of white cell count at presentation, age over 40. Importantly, age over 40 is, is a risk factor not just for treatment failure, that is the increased chances of the ALL returning, but an uh, independent risk factor for high transplant-related mortality, particularly in the myeloablative setting, but perhaps reduced intensity transplantation may not actually save these patients from uh, toxicity with respect to transplant. They've incorporated high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities, as I listed previously on a slide, but critically they've also incorporated uh, MRD uh, during the, uh, the uh, consolidation part of the 
the uh, treatment regimen. And this, pub this was published by that group a couple of years ago, the first author is Patel, and really just shows that uh, those patients who have MRD positive versus MRD negative at a number of different stages of their treatment, either during phase one of remission induction, phase two, post-intensification, or even delayed to six to nine months during the therapy, uh, could stratify patients on, with respect to their ultimate disease outcome, those patients who were persistently MRD negative doing better than those patients who are MRD positive. And there's a number of other publications which are listed here which have really shown that those patients who have persistently detectable disease by MRD studies have poorer outcomes, those patients who are persistently MRD negative have uh, better outcomes, and that's again shown in this, this publication by continuous monitoring that if you became MRD positive at any time, then your prognosis was substantially reduced. So the, the question really is, is that's fine. You can stratify on whether patients retain MRD negativity or not, but does in intervention, and more specifically, does allogeneic transplantation actually make a difference? Or does being MRD positive after remission induction or consolidation therapy just indicate that you've got biologically bad disease and really your fate is already sealed. And so, the, so potentially MRD allows us to have this risk adapted versus an unrestricted transplant approach. And certainly the, you, there, are, there are practitioners around that would say that an adult patient with ALL has got such bad disease that they should just be transplanted if you can find a donor and what sort of donor that is, whether they're a sibling donor or an unrelated donor or a haplo or a cord, is really dependent on how well you think they'll tolerate the, uh, the transplant conditioning and transplant procedure. But there's also, in the upper box, allows you to stratify patients on risk, intermediate, standard, or high risk, and those patients who are MRD negative or MRD positive and determine who gets transplantation and who doesn't. And the, 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 pro probably one of the critical things about MRD monitoring is not necessarily identifying those patients who you desperately need to transplant, but possibly identifying those patients who are persistently MRD negative, who you may be able to avoid transplantation, as so that's sort of flipping the, the equation the other way. And here's a couple of examples of that from the GML and the Pathema groups, where those patients who in the GML group who are persistently MRD negative, um, they, they, uh, um, they had maintenance treatment uh, and a high-dose um, high uh, uh, conditioning and allogeneic transplantation was omitted in those MRD-negative patients, whereas the MRD-positive high-risk group were allografted, and that seemed to the patients who weren't allografted didn't seem to be uh, any worse off if they had gone into their maintenance being MRD-negative. In their Pathema group, uh, analysis, they had a similar sort of uh, approach. This was in pH negative uh, patients, that if they were MRD uh, negative post consolidation, their allograft was deferred, and if they became MRD positive, they were subsequently allografted. But if they remained persistently MRD positive, then they went on to allogeneic transplant. And again, their preliminary data suggested that there was no detriment of deferring allograft in those patients who achieved MRD negativity. This is the, uh, the uh, Northern Italian Leukemia Group ALL study, which was published uh, about 18 months or so ago, and really just incorporated MRD. I won't go into the details of this. If you just focus on phase B to the right-hand side of the slide there, those patients who had MRD negativity went on to receive maintenance therapy. Uh, those patients that were considered to be standard risk by conventional uh, clinical and cytogenetic analysis who the MRD was unknown and there was just a small number of those went on to maintenance therapy. But anybody who was MRD positive or anybody who had high risk clinical features where you didn't know their MRD went on to either receive an allogeneic transplant if they had a donor or a series of high dose chemotherapy supported by autologous stem, cell tra uh, stem cells and then subsequent maintenance therapy if they didn't have an allogeneic donor. And really the, the take home message is here that if they were persistently MRD negative, they had a much better outcome than those patients who were positive and the p-value was so small that it couldn't be recorded, it was just quarters as four zeros. And uh, those patients who were persistently MRD positive, what happened to them? Well, if they went on to receive allogeneic transplant or high dose sequential chemotherapy with autologous stem cell support, they had a much better outcome than if they just had chemotherapy. Uh, those patients, there was, they, this group could not discern a difference between uh, 
uh, the allogeneic and the autologous support, uh, they, they seem to have similar outcomes. And then the, in the, the lowest slide there in C shows that those patients who went into their uh, 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 post-remission uh, consolidation who were MRD positive, if they subsequently became MRD negative, their outcome was substantially improved, and as you can see from that lower curve there. Okay, I'm going to skip over some of this because I want to talk about reduced intensity transplantation in the last minute or so. And there's a number of series of um, analyses which have been done. Some are registry, some are single centre, some are multi-centre. But none of them have prospectively been analysed in a prospective sense, but that has been incorporated in the UK ALL14 study. Essentially, the take-home message is, can be shown here that this is a registry analysis of myeloablative conditioning versus reduced intensity transplantation in ALL, and what you uh, gain on uh, a decreased in non-relapse mortality, which is the lower curve there in the NRM graph, you lose with respect to lack of uh, control with, of the underlying disease, increased relapse rate, and therefore no difference in overall survival. Here's a list of a number of approaches with respect to reduced intensity transplantation, some of the multi-centre, some of the registry, some are single centre. And there's two things to take home from this, this slide, that really that the um, uh, uh, graft versus host disease rate was really still quite high despite a reduced intensity approach, and the transplant-related mortality in these, in these groupings was still somewhere between 20 30 and even upwards of 40%, so that even with reduced intensity transplant, particularly in high-risk ALL, uh, there's still a challenge of getting these patients through transplant. Susan very graciously covered pH-positive ALL, and you've, uh, you would have seen this is her data has already been shown, and uh, I just can confer with her uh, conclusions that this is an alternative way of inducing remission in older or younger patients, either with corticosteroids. Uh, or with uh, multi-agent chemotherapy with, very, with excellent remission induction rates and uh, pre uh, preventing exposure to um, substantial toxicity in older, frailer patients with corticosteroids. Um, I also concur with her conclusion that it's still ultimately in pH-positive ALL, which you agreed in your survey responses, uh, ultimately patients should be transplanted. And this is taken from a review that was, just came out a few weeks ago, um, uh, which really was an algorithm which I can't fault and I think is based on data, and you can have a look through it yourself really, but basically those patients who have pH positive ALL, they should receive TKI-based induction therapy. If they achieve a remission and have a donor, they should have a transplant. If they have no donor, then they should have some form of maintenance therapy. Uh, those patients who are, are pH negative have induction therapy. If they don't get a remission, you've got to do something to get them into remission and then take them to transplant. If they do attain a remission uh, but can be stratified either on clinical grounds or MRD grounds into high risk or standard risk, if they have a donor and have high risk disease, they should be transplanted. If they're older or have comorbidities, it seems reasonable to offer them a reduced intensity transplant. And uh, really, with that conclusion, I'll stop there with another picture of uh, beautiful Melbourne. Thanks very much.